but that, yeah, that mentorship is all present along the way. You're mentoring somebody to say, hey, I think you're going to be good at this. And then once they see that you have faith in them, then they want to come along too. So if I show them ways in which, hey, look, I struggled too as an undergraduate, and these are things that help me. And so I'll provide them many different ways of, of figuring it out. What I do with all my students is I have one-on-one -on -one meetings, kind of like conversations like you and I are having right mm -hmm. now. I meet with each one of them on a one-on-one -on -one basis every two weeks. And the reason why I do it two weeks is because we think about, we talk about where things are at and things that they should get done. And a two-week scale is enough of a window that if they have a busy week, then they can offset the busy week with a not so busy week. And I always find that two weeks is enough for them to make uh, contributions to their, their research or studies. But the other thing too, with all of them in those meetings, it's um, you got to keep in mind that they are humans. And so I start off all my meetings with saying, how are you? And I want to know how they are, because if it's a stressful, you know, doing fitting in an undergraduate thesis project or fitting in your research with a master's degree, during your master's degree with coursework and TAing and of personal life, it can be stressful. And so I first want to see how they're doing. How, the, how they, are they feeling overwhelmed? And if they are, um, I say, okay, let's put the brakes on. Let's stop. Let's reorganize this. And with the graduate students, it's a little bit, the conversation's different because I can say to a master's student, okay, first year, what I want you to do is I want you to think about a pie and you break that pie up into thirds. And I say, for the first year, all I really want you to do is a third of that pie is your coursework, a third is your TA, the other third is your me time. And document, like over the next two weeks, I want you to kind of see how much time you're putting into each. If it's out of whack, let's talk about that. And notice how I said to them, your research will come, we'll do that later. But if you have time, then we'll, we'll add that on. Um, and that starts, I said, as coursework reduces, then we, we offset that with your research work. And I found that that, when they start thinking about it that way, they start realizing, okay, you know, I don't have to do everything. Mike's not asking me to do, be a superhuman. Um, I don't want students to burn out. Burnout can happen. There's, it, it's, it's a high stressful anxiety environment, but it doesn't have to be. And that's what our, our role as supervisors are, is to have foresight and to see, okay, well, Let's, let's put your focus here. And I'd be lying if I said all my, all my grad students went through their grad degree easily. Uh, you know, they kind of joke about it, they, saying that, you know, who hasn't cried in front of their supervisor? <laughs> and it's true, but I want them to feel comfortable that yeah. the, I can be that person. And it's not, they're not crying because of I've, anything I've done to them. It's because things seem overwhelming. And there have been students where I've said, you know what, you need to take a break. Let's go through the process of, of taking a, a break, a, a temporary leave. Or in, I remember one student, I saw the student at a conference uh, last week that I just came back from, and the student just finished up um, her PhD. And, but during her master's degree, the first year, I basically said, okay, she was having a rough, she came to me, we had this meeting, and I said, okay, let's stop everything. Let's just you know, take this term and figure out what you want to do and no obligations, nothing. And it's probably, and she thanked me for that because it's probably the, one of the best things that happened to her because then she was able to pick it up and turn it around uh, and finish up really strong and go on to do a PhD. And now she's in the workforce and, and, and loving it. So, um, so she's, I'm, I'm not saying I was that person that, that did it for her, but there are little things like that where we have to understand as supervisors that they are human, we are human, and we got to get that human element first taken care of. And sometimes when you reach out to somebody like that, they will be more likely to be more productive because they realize, oh, I'm not just, you know, this working machine or the, my supervisor isn't expecting me to be a machine. They expect, they understand that there's, there's going to be times where I'm not going to be able to do as much as possible. Um, you know, you work with me. You don't work for me. You don't work under me. You work with me. Let's work together on this. Um, and, and so that's the partnership that we have. I mean, we've chosen here to choose a regional approach. Now, that, what that means is that we go through each region of the body and talk about the, the muscles, the, the musculoskeletal system, and the nerve supply and blood supply uh, for those regions. 
And the reason for that is most students, as a because I am in the kinesiology depart, department, and most of the students are in uh, the kinesiology department, they will need this understanding to, to move on. And so when I thought about how to present this course, before I even started, stepped foot in, in an anatomy lecture at Laurier, I reached out to colleagues who were teaching anatomy and asked them what they did, uh, what textbooks they used, what resources they used, uh, took a look at their syllabi, and kind of formulated what I thought I would like to do. Now, prior to coming to Laurier, I had the benefit of teaching as a PhD student. I taught a, a neuroanatomy course. Now, neuroanatomy is a different beast altogether, but that really got me thinking about, well, what is it that, how do I think about this? How do I learn the material? Things, I always say to people, things never came easy to me. There are some people who, where information comes easy to them. I have a brother like that, and it just comes easy to him. It always drove me crazy. Uh, but I always had to work hard at, at understanding things. I had to find new techniques to help store things in memory or learn material. And so the first thing I always say to students in anatomy specifically is you don't memorize anatomy, you learn anatomy. And they say, well, what's the difference? I said, well, the difference is if you learn something, then you won't forget it. And, and if you memorize it, you will forget it. So we're gonna take steps to learning material and the way I present the material and, and how I interact with the students and the questions I give them on the exam is teaching them how much do you actually know? Not how much can you memorize, how much do you know? And, um, I'll, and the way I do that is my exams have three tiers of questions and I tell them right from the start. There's tier one are your straight regurgitation ones. I don't really like those types of questions, so I limit those to about 20% of the exam. So I say to them, if you're gonna memorize this, I'll tell you what your mark is gonna be on the midterm. But the majority of the exam is what I call level two, which is understanding. So I'll say, you know, how are this structure and this structure, what's common about them or what's different about them? And, or I'll say, you know, what is, what is different? What doesn't belong in this, in these group of, of, of options because that's really testing their knowledge so what do you really know and then the third level is the applied questions I spend most of my time when I during my office hours with students not teaching the material but teaching them how to learn so I'll give them I'll say okay well you know they're different types of learners yeah how do you learn best and they may not know I said well how are you studying for the exams and this always happens after midterm and it's usually the students who I see the exact, I've been doing this long enough that I see the same students all the time. It's the students who are very good students, but didn't do as well as they wanted to or believe that they should have. Uh, because anatomy gives you a false sense of, of hope at the end of a midterm <laughs> because it's multiple choice. There are an, there's an option for everything. And you're obviously circling an answer that you think is correct. So you walked away confident, but you may not have got that correct mark. So I'll sit down with them, go through their midterm. And just by looking at their midterm, if they, don't, if they don't tell me how they studied, I said, I can tell you how you studied. I know exactly how you studied based on what you got wrong. And, and so we'll go through that and say, okay, well, try some new techniques. Here are some new techniques I would like you to try. Here, I, I'll give them a couple options. I said, well, now you choose, but these are ways in which you're learning the material. And you know, one of the things that we're always taught here is active learning. I remember when I first came here, um, and it must have been my second year in all the workshops that, we, that I went to, it was always about active learning, active learning. I said, okay, so what does that mean? <laughs> and so you tell the students, okay, don't, don't be a passive learner, don't just sit here and write notes, be active. And then you kind of leave it at that. But there were no tools in place, or I didn't place, put tools in place to help them know what it meant to be active. Once I understood how they could be active, then I would give them those tools if they met with me, or sometimes in class I would say, Okay, let's, let's take a step back and think about it this way. So if we're talking about a particular muscle, I say, okay, if we wanna go and strengthen this muscle, what might you do in a resistance way to train this muscle? And some of them have to say, well, you have to think about it. Well, how does this muscle move? Or uh, I'll stop and say, okay, well, I'll give you some of the information. Let's pull the class. And I'm not gonna say if you're right or wrong. Let's pull the class and say, what do you think this muscle does? Or, or, or something like that, just to get them engaged with, so, well, that's active learning. You're thinking about this and this, 
but how did how did, how do you solve what I'm asking you based on the two pieces of information I gave you? You know, if you're good at this, that's great. But if I can find your weakness, it's going to spend more time on your weakness to elevate it to the level of your strengths. That's what you want. Same thing with, with school. Why would you keep going back to what you know when really you should be working on what you don't know? And I always say, we as humans don't like to be told what we don't know. It's... <laughs> I don't like to be told what I, I mean, most of us don't like to be told what we don't know. But I said, this, here's a way that you're showing yourself what you know and what you don't know. If you don't do this, I'll guarantee you, when you go to study, you're going to start off with the stuff that you know. Yes. And then you're going to run out of time. There. Yeah, you're going to yeah. run out of time and not get to the stuff that you don't know. What I want you to do is elevate your understanding of the material that you don't know right now. And so, like I said, I spend more time teaching them how to learn than I do the material. Students have said to me, and maybe they're, they're being nice to me because they say it to my face, but they said, that was the best course they've taken. It was, and I said to them, I said, it's a lot of work. You know, you're doing things, but it's not as if you're doing nothing, studying for a midterm, you write that midterm, and then you're kind of, you know, relaxed. There's no peaks and valleys. It's, it's basically you're plateauing. Like you're getting up there and you're keeping that keeping workload going. constant. And after a while, they don't feel like it's, it's overwhelming just because they're used to doing this.